Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. It's a real pleasure to be here physically after a year and a half of talking to cameras. Um, so I don't know how many of you are more technically oriented. Part of my, uh, my presentation at the beginning is very high level. Uh, the, the end is more technical, oriented towards more developers, people who actually want to try the technology. But uh, uh, there should be enough for everybody to enjoy. So uh, you may have seen the de description of my presentation. I actually talk about blockchain as being a new type of database. And quite frankly, it's a bit of a provocative statement. There are people, hardcore believers into blockchain being a completely new revolutionizing uh, technology. I, you may, you know, maybe I'm a bit boring, I'm old, but uh, you know, for me it's just yet another technology. It's an important evolution, but at the end of the day, it's a system that you use to store data and retrieve data from, and to me that makes it a database. Of course, it has very different characteristics than traditional databases, and we'll get through some of this. And, but, you know, I still feel like it's reasonable to call it a database. So let's get to this. First, let's talk about, you may have heard of blockchain being also referred as a decentralized ledger. So what is this all about? First, let's start stepping back and talk about ledgers. What are ledgers? Ledgers are by no means new, right? They've been around since the 15th uh, century, uh, and they've been used by businesses to keep track of what's going on with their business. So we typically refer to two key aspects related to ledgers. There's the notion of transactions, which are typically, you know, they refer to asset transfer of one kind or another. It's things that are either coming out of your business or getting into your business that you will record those events, those transactions into your ledger. And traditionally, this is done with like big books that you know, were used to store information. And, uh, and then there's this notion of contract. So you basically, you know, as a company, will uh, enter into some kind of business contract with another company, whether it's a supplier or a customer, and you basically agree on some kind of transactions with certain conditions and uh, transactions being executed for a given uh, outcome. And so these are like the contracts that we are talking about that basically governs the transactions that are taking place with your business in and out, right? So of course, you know, the evolution with the digitalization of the business has been to move from these paper ledgers to computer IT systems that basically replicate these kind of systems into, you know, digital systems. The problem we have with the, this first step of the evolution is we end up with the situation which is depicted on this slide, where essentially you have a network of business partners who are interacting with one another under those contracts, and each participant in the network is basically recording their versions of what's going on in their own ledger. All the different ledgers are being maintained completely independently by each participant. When everything goes as planned, it's not a problem. Everything works well. The problem happens when there is something that doesn't happen the way it was expected. So maybe you were expecting to receive some order, something that you ordered from your supplier, it's not happening. Or there is a payment that didn't come in on time. And so there is a breach of contract somewhere, but the problem is to be able to come to an agreement with the other party on what happened, what went wrong. At that point in time, each party has their own version of what's happening or what has happened to that point. So you go into what we call the reconciliation exercise, where basically the different parties involved in the transaction have to compare notes. And you try to find where things went wrong and come to an agreement. 
This is actually a very costly uh, and time consuming exercise during which typically assets will be frozen and it you know, generally creates a lot of friction in the network. So it's quite inefficient and an expensive process. What blockchain and decentralized ledgers are about is to try to solve that very problem so that instead of having all these different ledgers being maintained independently, we create a system which will keep all these different ledgers in sync with one another. This is what I like to call reconciliation upfront. So essentially, instead of saying each party is going to write their own version of what's going on, their own transaction, their own record of the transactions that are taking place, we're going to have a system where we submit the transaction to the network. When the network agrees, yes, this is what's happening, we can all record it in our own copy of the ledger. So we still have our own copy of the ledger, but now it's being kept in sync with everybody else. So when thing goes wrong, well, we don't have to go through this reconciliation exercise anymore because we all have the same version of the record. This is what we call, you know, the universal source of truth. So it actually saves us this trouble of trying to figure out what went wrong. We all know there is no dispute. So resolution can come up much faster. What's really important is this notion is, you know, so we have this shared replicated ledger. We'll get to talk a little bit more about the permissioned aspect. That's actually uh, uh, a different dimension. What's really important in the scenario I'm describing is the notion that we have to have consensus in the network to come to an agreement on what needs to be recorded or what it is right to, re to record on the ledger. And there is this notion that, well, we can tell which transactions come from where. And the ledger is such that it's immutable. So once something is recorded, you cannot change it, especially not unilaterally. The problem with the, if the, the before picture that we saw earlier is also that anybody is in control with their own record, which means they can change their record if they want to, right? You would have no view on what happened with their ledger. So in that way, it cannot, you know, it's only worth what the people claim it is to be. And um, the other aspect is finality. So again, because this is shared by everybody and nobody can change anything uh, without the consensus from everybody else, it means you have a final record of what happened. This is what really blockchain is all about. There are, there are different types of blockchains. And you probably have all heard about Bitcoin, unless you've been living under a rock. Bitcoin, you know, deserves a lot of credit because it's really at the origin of the blockchain movement. However, it's important to realize that, in fact, Bitcoin is a specific application of a technology which is much more broadly applicable. And this is why IBM got interested. Of course, as you can imagine, IBM is a big research center. We had researchers looking into Bitcoin from the early days, especially people involved in cryptography and all this stuff. They, they were really interested in what was going on. At the same time, from our point of view, this was not so interesting in and of itself until we realized that, as I was saying at the very beginning, fundamentally, what we're talking about is a system of record that is shared among a, a, a network of business partners. And this is broadly applicable to any kind of data. In the case of Bitcoin, they use this system to record exchange of coins, this new digital currency. And they can keep track of who owns what. If I have a coin, I can give it to somebody else or a fraction of a coin. But and, and this is being recorded, so at any moment we can tell who owns what and where each coin came from, because you can see the history of the coin with all the transactions on the ledger. Now, 
you can imagine that you can expand on this instead of recording transactions of coin related to a coin we can record transactions related to the ownership of a house of a, a car or anything we really want right so what's fundamentally important about blockchain is this notion that we have this distributed ledger that provides an irrefutable proof right we have this set of transactions that is being recorded so why do we call it blockchain without getting into the details? Basically, it's a, it's a way of encapsulating all the transactions into a set of transactions which form a block. And the block itself is hashed. So we have a, a cryptographic uh, v signature of the, the set of transaction, which is then embedded in the next block. And so it's kind of like Russian doll type of system where by definition, if you change anything in any block, you break the signature and all the other blocks behind. So it becomes, the more you add blocks, the harder it becomes to change anything in the ledger. So I, will, I did talk a little bit briefly, or I, there was a mention of permission ledger. Let me talk a little bit more about this. Bitcoin is a permissionless blockchain network which means that there is no need, there is no access control to the system. Anybody can join. There is actually a, a program you can download it on your machine and start running Bitcoin. You will join the Bitcoin network immediately. Nobody is going to stop you. And you can start participating. You can start downloading all the transactions, seeing all the transactions that happen, and possibly submit transactions to the network. On the other hand, it's... It's, not, it's meant to be anonymous, although it's really pseudonymous. You actually use some kind of ID that is associated with you to do all your transactions. Nobody can really see who is behind each ID, which is why it's so commonly used like, you know, in ransomware, because once the money is transferred to some ID, we have no way to know who is behind this. At the same time, there is no privacy because if two people exchange transaction, we have to reveal our IDs to actually make the transaction happen, to say, I'm exchanging Bitcoin from this ID to this other ID. Over time, you can actually build uh, basically a directory of all the IDs that, of the people or the parties you're interacting with. And because the, the ledger is public, you can actually trace all the other transactions that those IDs are doing or have done. So in terms of privacy, it's actually fairly weak. If you think about the way business networks function, it's pretty much the opposite. Businesses typically work in a network of, of partners. They actually know who they are. Nobody's hiding behind some uh, uh, fake identity, or not fake, but some digital identity that you don't know who is behind. And on the other end, they want privacy. You don't want all your suppliers to see how much you're buying from each supplier and so on. So this is what actually has motivated IBM to start working on this and, and develop a solution. There was no system that actually did that, address those problems. So let me give you some concrete examples before I go further into what the solution is. TradeLens is one of the early platforms we developed with a company called Maersk, which is like the biggest container shipping company in the world. And their problem wasn't so much keeping track of where the containers are when they are shipping from one point A to point B around the world, but it's all the paperwork associated with this. There's a huge amount of signatures and stamps they need to get along the way. And so there's a paper trail that actually obviously follows a different path entirely from the container itself. And this is actually their biggest burden because it involves many different parties. It is going to involve people like, of course, the actual transporter, but port authorities, insurance companies, customs, and so on. So, all along the way, they have to ensure that they get all the right signatures, all the right authorizations. 
So basically, we developed a system that allows all these different companies to join this network so that when they're starting to ship a container from one place to another, there's a record associated with that container or that shipment. And every time one party or another has to sign, they can just add to the ledger associated with that shipment. And at any point on time, in time, we can always go back and do an audit, see what happened. Another system we, we developed initially with Walmart, it's now extended uh, uh, throughout the, the food industry, is IBM Food Trust, which is a platform to keep track of provenance of you know, food-related uh, products. So you can do things like, you may know that, for instance, in the industry, there is like E. coli, e. coli uh, uh, breakout every year, almost it seems. And, and what happens is the stores are being informed that there is a breakout in some form, but nobody knows where the, the, the letters from that form are. There is actually the information is somewhere, but it takes so long to actually figure it out that it's safer to just take out all the letters. So there's a huge amount of waste because we are throwing out all sorts of letters so independently of where they come from. So basically, we have been able to develop systems now that will allow us to keep track of the provenance of all the food items throughout the food industry, supply chain so that we can actually identify very clearly which item come from which uh, producer on the shelves. So when there is a case like this, uh, we can actually do a much more uh, narrowly scoped uh, uh, recall. One of the newer examples we have, we have developed the digital health pass, which, you know, with the COVID, we've all, we actually, some of you probably use different applications today to show that you got vaccination for COVID. And so IBM actually developed a platform to do that. And uh, it's actually used like, you know, by different governments around the world. Uh, New York, the Excelsior uh, uh, platform is based on the IBM uh, DHP. And essentially, it's a system that allows verification of credentials. And it's specifically targeted for health. It's not limited to vaccination, it could be anything that's health related. But the idea is to allow verification of credentials while the, the, the user is actually in control of what gets disclosed and who to whom and where the supplier, the issuer of the credential is not involved at all in the verification process. So the naive application, right, the implementation of a system like this is you have a central system, the supplier sets up, and every time you go check your, valid, you know, your vaccination, basically it's going to make a query to the issuer to verify this is valid. With this kind of decentralized system, we can store the keys that allow the verification of the, the credentials without the issuer being involved. It's also important to know, despite all the crazy stuff people are saying, this system do not store any personal data on the blockchain. They actually store basically cryptographic keys associated with the issuer. This is like your lab or you know, your health provider who's been doing the vaccinations on the chain so that the credential that's given to you that's stored in your electronic wallet can be verified with those keys, but it doesn't contain any personal data whatsoever. So these are the kind of examples of applications that we have been developing with this kind of technology. So let me get now to Hyperledger Fabric. So as I was saying, once we realized there was a need and we actually did a fairly extensive survey of all the different systems that existed at the time, we're talking back in 2014, 15, we realized there was no system that existed, so we embarked into developing our own with different principles uh, that were really tuned towards the, the needs of the enterprise. 
So we developed hyperledger fabric, which was then contributed to the hyperledger uh, uh, project, and um, which is now developed in open source. So there are different characteristics, some of which you will recognize. You know, I've talked about permissioned, uh, so that we can control who has access to the network to start with. We have enforce privacy so that you, not everybody sees everything. We have finality. There are a lot of systems like Bitcoin where you actually don't really know when the transaction that has been submitted that is actually accepted by the network will stick to it or not. There's too much, you know, I would have to get into too low level details to explain, but you have just enough to say that some transactions can be reverted afterwards. Well, in the business case, this is difficult to deal with. So we design a system where there is no such thing. So once your transaction has been accepted and recorded, it's never reversed. So it's final. We also wanted systems that are performant. And then there's notion of smart contracts that basically implements the logic of the application, that it will be application specific. And uh, there are different systems that make different choices. Uh, some that have developed like specific, you know, languages. So if you know about Ethereum, for instance, for instance, they have their own language. They have defined for writing smart contracts, such as Solidity. And uh, we made the choice to allow enterprise developers to use whatever programming language they wanted. And there are things like mining and, you know, cryptocurrency are not part of this system at all. You can use it to develop an application that is dedicated to, you know, digital currency, but it's not part of the system. And I won't go into the detail, but the rest is a bit more technical, but, you know, one key aspect is that we thought that this is fairly new, uh, innovative technology, where a lot of new things will still be, you know, coming up. So we made it very modular, so things could be changed and evolve over time. So as I was saying, this is a part of a bigger organization, a consortium, if you will, called Hyperledger, which is technically it's a collaborative project of the Linux Foundation. And uh, it was, you know, uh, one of the fastest growing organization in the history of the Linux Foundation. Uh, we had over 200 members just a few years ago. It's come down a bit because the hype is over, which I think is a good thing. Uh, but, you know, we still have a significant number of uh, members. I know it's very small, but it's just to give you an idea that you're supposed to say, wow, there's a lot. <laughs> That's the message of the slide. So Hyperledger Fabric, the technology that I'm going to be talking about, is now available, um, you know, provided on all the different major cloud providers today. So. Now, let me tell you a little bit more about, you know, the evolution of Fabric. So we started in 2015. In 16, we had the, the you know, a first version of, um, uh, within Hyperledger, it was called Fabric 05, then 06. Then we had a major redesign because by then we had already engaged with customers and realized, okay, this architecture is too uh, limiting. We, we had a major redesign. And so in 2017, basically one year after the launch of Hyperledger and, uh, and the contribution of the code to Hyperledger Fabric, um, we released version 1.0, which created, it was very unique at the time and introduced a lot of different um, aspects that were really not common into the blockchain space. For instance, we introduced the notion of channels. So initially we thought, well, to provide you know, uh, participants in the network privacy, we make it permissioned. So as I was saying, now we control access. But we realized, well, even in a network, if the network is big enough, people don't always want to share everything within the network. So we created the notion of channels, which allows us to segment further the network into subgroups so that within the network, you can have different subgroups that can actually you know, intersect in many ways and provide people with more privacy. 
I'm not going to get into the, all the details, but we had some major milestone, and I actually removed a lot of the, the, <laughs> this slide has evolved over time, and it's a lot simpler than it used to be because it was getting way too crowded. But some of the big milestone is, you know, in 2019, we had the first LTS version. This is long-term service when the community said, well, you can use this and we will keep maintaining it for quite a while. It was actually the commitment was for a year and a half. We did a bit more. But then we had a version 2.0 in the early 2020. And we took a couple of iterations, you know, 2.1 and 2.2 before we created a new LTS. The big, there were several big changes, and I'll talk more about the axis of development next, but, you know, we had some uh, major changes that justified upgrading or uh, increasing the, the version number, the major version from 1x to 2x. And basically, we have evolved since then, both version, the 1.4 branch and the 2 uh, branch, and we just actually recently uh, ended the 1.4 branch, saying, okay, this is the last LTS on the 1X branch. So everybody, please upgrade to 2X is the message we're telling, because, you know, of course, there could be some major uh, issue and we might feel compelled to fix the 1X branch. But essentially, we don't want people to keep developing with or using 1x in production, and everybody should be transitioning to 2x. So now we have a new LTS with the 2.2, and this is what people should use in production, and we are working on the 2.3 and now 2.4 are the latest versions that we're working on. There is actually a 2.4 alpha and beta that were actually already released, and our goal is to have the 2.4 um, released by the end of this year with some of the latest development. So rather than going through all the details of all the different uh, features, what I thought would be interesting is to give you a kind of high level view on how the software has been evolving over time. This is what I call the axis of development of Fabric. So, we have seen many different development in the, uh, related to privacy and confidentiality. As I was saying earlier, we started with one network, then we, managed, we created this notion of channels that allows you to segment the network. Then we actually introduced a notion of private data, which allows to go even further than that and encrypt some data. Some so that there is auditability and so on, but not everybody sees everything. You can decide who gets to see what, and there is further development happening in that space. It's actually, thanks to a lot of advancement in cryptography, we can do a lot of things that just weren't, cap you know, we couldn't do, they were not practical. There's a lot of things in cryptography that has been possible for a long time, but they would take so long they were just not usable in practice. Now they become usable, and so we see more and more development happening in that space, uh, thanks to the, the evolution of computer uh, capabilities. Um, in terms of decentralization, we've also seen several improvements. So we started with a system based on a Kafka, which is crash fault tolerant, which meant that the system, you could actually run different peers, for each participant, so that if one were to crash or a few, you could still resist to this. However, they were part of the system that, you know, were fairly centralized, and it's not all of it, and some people were very critical, saying, ah, this is not decentralized. <laughs> but it was actually much more decentralized than they want to, you to believe. But, uh, this is something like related to the consensus process, and I'll talk a little bit more about this on the next slide or so. But um, this is part of the system that was actually designed to be pluggable so that consensus algorithm is an evolving uh, science. There are people, that's what they do. They keep working, trying to invent new algorithms that'll be more efficient. 
and uh, that will be more scalable, more resilient to different aspects. And so we actually designed Fabric so that we could change the algorithm used without tearing apart the whole system. So we started with the system based on Kafka, which is actually you know, an outside library. It's not developed uh, within Fabric. But we actually recently moved to Raft, which is crash fault tolerant, but is also decentralized so that different pieces on the network or different participants, I should say, can participate in the consensus process. And there is actually work underway. So for those who are not very familiar with this, there's some big categories of consensus algorithm. There is what's called crash fault tolerant, and there is what's called Byzantine fault tolerant. Byzantine fault tolerant is designed so that you can actually resist to attack by some players, some part, a certain amount of participants who are actually compromised and are trying to you know, uh, impact the system negatively. And so we actually have development in that space now as well. So I'm not going to get too more into this. Serviceability is another aspect. So just to give you an idea, at the very beginning, when we, had, we started with Fabric, if you wanted to change anything, you basically had to shut down the whole system, change some configuration, and restart. Obviously, when you have a system in production, that's not an acceptable uh, state of affairs. So we evolved to a system that are much more dynamic and much more serviceable overall. We also keep making a lot of progress in terms of performance, even though it's very performant compared to many other systems out there. Um, there's still, you know, people, there are actually a lot of, there's a big community and we regularly have people from the outside who come and made some studies. Sometimes universities come with report and they say, hey, look, we, you can do this and that and you'll get that much more performance. And so we're always open to trying to make it uh, more performant. Sometimes it's actually changing some components that are we actually using that we didn't develop, like the database actually being used underneath. Ease of use, so I'll talk a little bit more about the latest development here, which is the embedded gateway. But this is, this system initially was very low level. So like at the very core, what we are storing, the data is in the form of a key uh, value pairs. And so everything that is more complex in structure has to be you know, packaged in such a way that it actually fits in a key value pair. But you know, over time, we have been uh, improving the system so that uh, the APIs are much higher level and easier to use for the application developer. Um, and then there are different types of extensions being done. I'm not going to talk about this now, but you know, there is a lot going on. I want to do a little bit more deep dive in the Fabric Gateway because that's the latest development. So if there's anybody who is involved or has looked into it before, want to know kind of what we've been working on. Essentially, uh, in some, you know, in a fairly recent past, we actually updated the API provided by the different SDKs. There are different SDKs in different languages and to make them a higher level. And we ended up with SDKs that were very heavy and that did a lot of things and in, on the client side, which made the client heavy and a lot of network uh, uh, communication going on. And so the latest development that is you know, already available as a beta and which will be part of the latest version 2.4 due uh, by the end of the year is to basically move a lot of that code into the peer itself so that it's much easier for the application. It makes the application much lighter. There is there a slide on the benefits to the users. So from a programming point of view, the good thing is the API itself doesn't change. It's mostly an implementation detail. So application developer that have been writing on the previous versions won't see much of a difference in terms of you know, uh, their programs. But um, the uh, implementation moves a lot of this code that's in the SDK into the peer directly. And I have a slide that will show you that. It actually has many different positive side effects, uh, one of which is 
the whole consensus process requires actually getting your transaction submitted to the network, getting enough participants in the network to approve the transaction to say, okay, I accept this transaction, to then be able to submit it for commitment, basically writing it onto the, the, the ledger so that everybody has agreed. And in the, in the version to this date, the client basically has to contact the different participants and collect all these endorsements and then you know, issue the transaction. So with the gateway, the peer will actually do all of this work for you, which means that the application only needs one connection to the peer it ends up talking, and it's the peer that will have the connection to the rest of the network, which it already has anyway. So it means that from a system administration point of view, it's also much easier. I have it in a graphic form, which may be a bit more telling, and which will give me an opportunity to give you a little bit of insight uh, to the architecture. So at the very top, we have what we call membership services. So we are in a permission network, which means we have to control access, which is done by controlling identities of the participants and the different components in the network. The system is again very um, um, pluggable. So there is a standard built-in Fabric CA, which is certificate authority that you can use, but you can also reuse a lot of the legacy system. Most companies don't want to create new ideas, so they want to be able to reuse what they already have. If you have an SDAP uh, you know, uh, system already running, you can reuse all your identities and not create new ones. But then the main components are you have the client, which through some SDK will talk to the network. There are two main components. There is the peer, which will actually store a little copy of the ledger and will run the smart contract, which is this piece of you know, application-specific logic that will validate the transaction. And then there is what we call the ordering system, which is where the consensus takes place among the network to decide the order of the transactions and create the new block that will be written. So in the new version, we have simplified things. So there's actually a swap, but that's irrelevant. It's just because it shows the flow of the transaction a bit uh, nicer than having lines that go around. But you see the new block is gateway in blue in the middle is the important piece. So basically now the client talks to the gateway which is built in into the peer and it's that gateway that does all the work with the other piece in the network. And the client just submits the transactions and basically it records an event handler associated with the, the, the transaction and it will be informed when everything has been done and completed into the network, it will be informed the transaction has been written. Oops, sorry, skip one. So now that's a lot of details that honestly most people, application developers don't need really to worry about. What's more important for the application developer is those two components that are in green on that slide. At the top, so you have the client, right? It's the part where you have the application where you're going to do something specific. And the other side is the smart contract. And the smart contract, as I said earlier, it basically runs in the peer, right? And if you will, this is not actually a very new novel concept. You know, going back to my analogy with databases, you know, we have these systems in, in databases as well. So essentially, it allows you to specialize the application on the back end. This is the back end, basically, of your application, and the client is the front end. So when you submit transaction, it actually is going to execute some function in the smart contract that will validate specifically for your application, that the transaction is valid. 
it will typically check on things like, well, do I have all the information that I need to make sense of this transaction? So imagine you're in an application where you keep track of the ownership of a car. Well, you need to know if you're trans transferring the asset from one owner to another. Well, I need to have the identity of the seller and the buyer and the identity of the asset that I'm transferring. So you will want to check this kind of stuff, right? But you also want to check on the, the state, the logical state of the application at that given time. Because if I say, oh, I'm transferring this asset from one owner to another, well, do they actually, are, are they actually the current owner? So that's more like the, the logical state of the application. So all these things are gonna be checked in the smart contract. So as an application developer, that's what you're going to focus on. You're going to focus on those two aspects, the smart contract and the client. The client issues the transactions and the smart contract validate those transactions. Then of course, the smart contract is not run only by you. It's actually something that will be installed on the network by the different participants that will take part into the consensus process, the validation of all the transactions, something that's shared among the participants. And it's the peer itself will actually have locally two versions of the data. There is the actual blockchain, which you can see there on the right, but it also uses what we call the world state, which is basically the instant representation of the blockchain because it's a bit like the balance on your, on your uh, bank statement, right? You can recalculate the balance any time by taking you know, all the transactions from the very beginning, but it wouldn't be very practical to recalculate everything every time from day one. So you also maintain the, cons the current uh, state of your uh, uh, balance uh, more readily. So the world state is basically contains that. From a smart contract point of view, all you have to do is get and put and delete kind of things. And yes, there's a delete. I said it's immutable. It doesn't mean that you cannot delete and change information. What it means is that every time you make this kind of modification, they will actually in turn, you know, generate more transaction. Just like with your bank account, if there is a bad transaction, you can reverse transaction. They don't go and remove the previous transaction. They just reverse it by creating a new transaction that reverses the transaction, right? It's exactly the same here. So it's immutable, it doesn't mean you cannot change anything. It just means the ledger itself cannot be changed. So let me move on because I also want to highlight a few other aspects. Hyperledger, as I said, is a consortium. There are many different projects going on. And Hyperledger Fabric, to be fair, is only one of six different ledgers today, okay? But it's the most popular one and it's definitely, you know, the most uh, uh, commonly used in the IT industry. But there are different, outside of the, the, the Hyperledger Fabric project itself, there's a whole bunch of labs. Labs is something we created a few years ago to allow the community to experiment with different developments. And there are actually many different labs, so they're not officially endorsed by the Hyperledger project yet, but there are potential you know, future projects or pieces of some of this might actually eventually migrate to Hyperledger Fabric itself. But I wanted to point out you know, there's a lot of activity going on in that space. So we have Operation Console that actually provides a user interface to uh, more easily manage the network. It's actually been contributed by IBM uh, recently, and it's actually what the IBM blockchain platform offering is, very, is based on. So it's actually been in production for several years. We have other aspects, Fabric Smart Client, I'm not going to get into the details of all of that. The token SDK is of interest to a lot of people. We don't have built-in support for digital assets in Fabric, but there, it's actually possible to have tokens. 
I mean, people often say, oh, why isn't there built-in support? If you actually look into the samples in Fabric, you'll see we have actually provided several samples that uh, implement different, uh, you know, standards token like ERC20. And um, so it's definitely possible, but you can do more. And so the Fabric token SDK, which is in the labs right now, is one of those. It actually shows how you can do more. We also have different projects going on, or labs, I should say. And well, Hyperledger Weaver is actually a lab, and Cactus is a project. It's a bit subtle, the difference, but there is some. I'm not going to get into this now. But um, what's important is this is a hot topic, in my opinion, right now, and this is where a lot of the focus is going to be. Because for several years, we have had different blockchain technologies being developed. And there are different permission networks that are being developed independently. And then next thing people want to do is actually join them. Because for instance, you have one network where you track asset ownership. And on another, you do payments. And guess what? You want to sell a car and you want to pay. So you want to pay on one end and exchange the asset uh, on another. And in fact, you want to make sure those two things happen at the same time so that if I'm buying a car, you know, with either the payment happens and, and I get the car or nothing happens, but you don't want one or the other to happen, not the other. So there's a need for interoperability between the different networks. And there are different technologies. Fabric is only one of them. As I said, there are many others. And so there are several uh, efforts now going on to try to bridge those gaps between the networks so you can actually have like atomic transactions across different networks. And the difficulty is to do that without adding centralization because it's very easy to make a central gateway, gateway that actually <laughs> is the central point, but that, is, that defeats the, the purpose. I did mention beer BFT. You may have seen that earlier when I was talking about consensus and the evolution. Uh, it's actually it's been developed by some of my colleagues who are experts in uh, cryptography and, uh, and consensus algorithm in uh, Zurich Lab at IBM. And it's, uh, it's, it's a much, much more efficient type of Byzantine fault tolerant algorithm that has ever existed until now. And so there's a lab that actually provides an implementation that would then be leveraged by uh, Hyperledger Fabric, but it can be used outside of Fabric as well. I'll leave it at that. If you are interested, just keep an eye. There are many of those going on. I just wanted to finish, give you a couple of pointers. If you're interested in playing with it, okay, I can give you two and three key points. Uh, the, 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 the first one is, well, we have an extensive documentation and there is a whole set of samples. We actually just last year did a complete uh, revamp of the samples because initially they were kind of developed organically and it was a bit all over the map. And so we actually had a very uh, thorough look at the samples and eliminated some and created new ones. So that actually provides a whole progression showing all the different main features of Fabric so that you can actually see how to use them, what they are good for. And the documentation keeps being uh, expanded. The latest addition, which is significant, uh, uh, you know, is a whole chapter on how to deploy a production network because a lot of the documentation is often like this in open source. You know, people, it's very developer oriented, but then, you know, it's like good enough to get started, but it doesn't take you to the last mile of going to production. And the last piece is the Visual Studio Code extension. It's developed by IBM, but it's freely available and is a great way to get started. It provides you with a complete framework where you can even create uh, so you can develop your smart contracts and your, your application in this, uh, with this extension. It will actually even run a local network in your system so you can actually test, exercise the, the smart contract and the client, and you can even debug your smart client, which is a great feature. So I provided the information there.
And the slides, I have updated the slide, uploaded the slides so you can find them. So with that, I'm just on time. So I'm going to stop here. I don't know if we have time. There's coffee break now. Maybe there's time if anybody has a question. Otherwise, I'm around all day. Yes? Sure. Uh, so if somebody wanted to get involved in development right now, uh, what tasks and branches they uh, pull down? Uh, the latest is actually pretty good. If everybody I heard is, is asking about which branch to start from, if you want. If you go to production, it's always better to go with the LTS. But if you're just starting to develop, might as well use the letters branch and use the new gateway. And so the change for those who may have done this before, the change from the old gateway to the new one is basically it's just the package names are different. But essentially, the rest is almost the same. So there is very little impact on your program. All right, well, yep. You were already starting to talk about it in your documentation, but it might be a bit developer-focused. So I'm, I'm with the United Nations Foundation, and we look at a lot of business use cases all the time to evaluate you know, the, the appropriate technology. Um, for a, for a non-technical user, could they, with business use cases, could they go into the documentation and basically figure it out? And if not, is there another resource they see? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'm biased, but you know I'm part of IBM, <laughs> and so there is actually extensive documentation also on the IBM site, and we actually have higher level use cases that are you know being developed there available where they can you can actually go through this, you can find the one that's closest to your uh, use case and start from there, and typically it'll be a bit easier. Yes, Daniela. I was, and the social impact special interest groups, both of those two would be a great place for you to get started and just see the use cases and also come in and talk about what you're doing. I know some folks that have been there already from the United Nations and uh, get some feedback from the community along with you know, the fabric developers. Yeah, so for those who are online and not may have heard not that may not have heard what Daniela was saying. There are six special interest groups in Hyperledger, and several of them actually focus on different aspects, different use cases, and, and get into developing like reference architecture and things like this on how to use their fabric to, to implement their pro or address their problem, their use case. All right. I'll respect everybody's time. I'm going to leave it at that. But again, I'm happy to stay around and talk to people. So thank you very much.